What's going on guys? Welcome back to another video. Today's interview is with the one and only Tom McLaughlin, the writer-director of Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives, which for a lot of Friday the 13th fans is their favorite. It is indeed mine, so it was a tremendous honor being able to sit down with Tom McLaughlin and discuss his new script called Jason Never Dies. Upon the announcement of this new script, fans had a lot of questions about what exactly it was, when we can see it, etc etc today we dive into some of those questions with tom and hopefully get some answers that you are looking for regardless it was a blast to sit down with him and i can't thank tom enough for taking the time to do this interview now with that as always thank you guys so much for watching and enjoy the video So I wanted to start by actually asking, when did this whole process begin? I heard that you started writing the script about a year ago, year and a half, but I imagine the story has been kind of bouncing around your head for nearly 30 years now. Yeah, um, you know, I kind of lose track of time because I'm very, um, I don't know, one could say multitask or I could also say schizophrenic and, <laughs> you know, AD or whatever. I'm, I'm doing so many things simultaneously. Uh, that I think it was about a year, year and a half, uh, two years maybe, that I actually said, you know, I'm going to do this thing. And um, I was certainly aware that the, uh, you know, that the, the fight was going on, the lawsuit, but it looked like it was coming to a close. And uh, so I started going back to all these different ideas that I had and kind of found the ones that really kind of jumped out at me. And this particular script has a lot of different elements in it. It's not just one thing. There's a number of things that sort of uh, make it, I hopeful, hopefully, unique and fresh to all the other ones. Um, but it's it's something that I, I, as I was writing it, it's sort of like you become kind of a, you know, just the person taking notes as somebody's talking to you. And when that happens, that's, you know, as most writers will tell you, that's ideal. So there's a lot of stuff that kind of came in there that I just kind of wasn't expecting. And then kind of went back later and looked at it and went, yeah, that's pretty cool. I don't want to, I don't want to sit in the theater and watch that happen. You know, so I'm, a, I'm such a fan of the horror genre. You know, I, I was trying to write something that I would love to see myself, whether it's going to please every fan, of course not. But, you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff in there that if you're, if you're more old school with it, um, and I, this is what a Friday is supposed to be, now I think you're going to dig it. Now, what can you really tell us about Jason Never Dies? All we've really heard is the fact that it takes place in the winter and that it may be a female-driven film. Well, you know, like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to keep my mouth shut because you know, I have this desire that I want to tell everybody everything. Um, and, of course, I got a lawyer going, you know, do not let too much out. And part of that reason, too, is there's so many fan films being done. It's so easy that any of these details can be done um, way before I get a chance to make this thing because I, I the size and the scope of it really requires, you know, a, a studio or a larger budget than what the fan, you know, funded kind of films are. But there's certainly ideas that can be used in the audience sees ahead of time, which I'm trying to trying to protect. Um, but basically, I, I want to kind of correct a couple of things, too, on the female thing. Uh, the immediate reaction was, oh, this is present day, you know, women in charge, all that kind of thing. And it's like, no, this is not a present day film. This actually takes place 13 years after my Friday the 13th, which was the 86. So if you do the math, that becomes 1999. Now, again, somewhat unintentional, 1999 was the era of Y2K. There was like a, a, a great fear. Now this has nothing, I emphasize, nothing to do with the story. It just is sort of a weird climate that was going on, you know, at that time in the in the world, literally. We didn't know if all the computers were going to go down. If you were a spiritual person, there was a lot of talk about, is this Armageddon? You know, what's going to happen when the clocks all turn to zero, zero, zero? So, you know, I was going, all right, well, that kind of works on just having it take place in that, you know, that time period. And then I have like, there's a point when one of the girls kind of references the thing about, you know, Y2K, but the other one says, well, the only thing cool about 1999 is if you turn it upside down at 666. So that was, a, you know, again, nothing relative to what's really going on with the Jason story, but, you know, just little things that kind of about that, that period. 
plus, you know, 99 and, and the 90s, there's so much 80s that sort of all kind of poured into, you know, the 90s. So I can still maintain that look and that feeling of what the original, you know, Fridays were like. Um, and, you know, and there is an innocence to these characters that they're not, you know, Jason aware as they were in Jason Lives. So I've tried to make that, you know, unique. And the truth, <laughs> the truth is um, these girls and women span from 15 years of age to 65. So, you know, you can try to figure that out on your own, but there, that there is that element that's also part of it. And these are not necessarily, you know, victims or empowered women. There are just a lot of different aspects to why I chose an all female cast to make this work. Uh, what else can I tell you? Um, yeah, I, I, I tried to put some new touches on Jason so that there's going to be some things that are going to be fresh and different uh, in just his overall look. And um, let me think. The other thing is, no, I guess I can tell you the opening, the resurrection of Jason is going to be, and I promise you this, the most spectacular opening of any Friday the 13th you've ever seen. It's going to do things that maybe certain fans will go, oh, I can't believe you're doing that. And other people are going to go, this is cool. This is fucking cool. So, you know, I'll leave you with that tease that the opening is going to be really spectacular. I mean, I'm already excited just hearing that alone. So, you know, a lot of people are big fans of yours and know that you originally had the idea to move forward with an Elias Voorhees ending to Friday the 13th Part 6 and kind of push that origin story a little bit for Jason. Is that the direction you plan on taking for Jason Never Dies? It, it's no, it, it really, in the simplest way, it, it literally is about Jason coming back and he is going to be filled with more rage than he ever has before. And he's going to have an, an additional agenda um, that is going to be completely right onto the mythology of what we all know. I'm not going to go off on some other tangent. And we are going to stay, you know, in the, in the Crystal Lake, you know, area for the whole movie. So it's all definitely takes place on the familiar ground. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not repeating like the Tommy Jarvis story. I'm not going into Jason as a young boy, you know, any of those things. It really is kind of a standalone piece you know from that standpoint and uh you know and it's not like i'm disavowing any of the movies that would happen you know after mine because as i said i'm sort of making a transition from from mine to 13 years later but it's like you can kind of take this as as a lot of the jason stories are you know did this really happen is this legend is this myth you know what's what's true and what isn't and we want to all feel like you know each time we see a movie that's another facet of it like a classic you know, Jason's story. Um, and then there's the ones that obviously, you know, take him to outer space, take him to hell. A lot of things have, you know, happened with him after the period that I'm talking about. But this is just, as I said, a, a, a kind of complete story in and of itself, but still ties into the overall mythology. Okay, that, that makes sense. One of the things I find the most interesting about the script in general, which a lot of people do as well, is the fact that it takes place in the winter. Uh, I love the fact that in part six that it takes place at a legitimate summer camp where there are children. Now, I imagine since this is in the winter, that that is no longer the case. No. Not a, yeah, it, that's another thing I have to clear up. It's not like I'm trying to do a summer camp in the winter. You know, it has nothing to do with that. It's not a ski lodge. None of that. <laughs> so, I, again, I don't want to say too much about it because it, it will kind of reveal, you know, what is going to be very unique about it. But where the kids... Uh, we're kind of in a sense to that, you know, some of the characters that are going to be, you know, in, in Jason Never Dies have that innocence of just not knowing about a Jason. So this appearance of this monstrous individual, you know, is quite, quite frightening and, and very unexplainable. Um, so, you know, I am trying to keep it fresh, you know, in that regard for the characters. Now, I imagine when you came forward with Jason Never Dies that you did not expect Horror Rink Sean Cunningham to go forward with an appeal in the lawsuit. Now, what direction do you plan on taking because of that? Uh, you already said that you probably need a bigger budget just to make this film possible. So do you just plan on waiting out the lawsuit? I kind of painted myself into a corner, yeah, <laughs> because I wanted to make something that was um, 
special and unique and and as i said you know with a you know a very huge uh opening uh, with the dealing with jason's resurrection and at the same time you know setting it in the snow as anybody who was shot in snow can tell you it's very difficult and so um i i have to minimalize you know the the filmmaker side of me the guy that's made what 40 what 42 films now knows that the only way to pull this off is I've got to build sets. You know, you can't have people out there for that amount of time and expect the snow to stay there because it melts, you know, the unexpected global warming that's messed up all these, you know, schedules these days about what the weather's supposed to do. Um, so yeah, the fact that I have to build sets and things and then shoot a good portion of the exteriors, obviously in real snow, all that has to be timed out and, and work. So it really would be like next to impossible to say, okay, you got 18 days to shoot this and this amount of money, go. It's just, there's too many other variables with this. But I just felt I wanted to give the audience and, and myself who loves, you know, these things, something that like, wow, I haven't seen that before. And, um, you know, the snow is an important aspect of that just because again, when the story takes place. Now, I just have to ask because I'm a diehard fan and there are a lot of diehard fans like me out there. Do you already have someone in mind for playing Jason? You know, I would love to see C.J. Graham again as he was Jason in part six, but a lot of people are going to be rooting for people like Kane Hodder and Derek Mears, which I also think would be great. But I'm just curious, what vision do you have right now for it? Well, I have to be honest that when I was writing it, I was picturing C.J., you know, his physicality, his way of moving and things. Um, not that I don't absolutely love Kane. I mean, I think Kane did a great job with it, and he brought some very unique touches to it, as he says himself, with the breathing and certain things that, you know, was a, a, a you know, kind of put his signature on it. Um, but CJ and I have been close for all these years, too, so it's really hard for me not to think of him. Um, you know, now it's a question of whether he'll be able to do it by the time, you know, we get this made, and I mean just based on his schedule or looking at some of the physicality of it, if it's, you know, within, you know, what he feels comfortable with. But we still haven't really talked about it because I've kept, you know, the script very close to the desk. But I did say that that's, you know, if, if I have my druthers, that's the way I'd like to go. You know, I don't think anyone's going to be disappointed with that answer. Uh, C.J. Graham did fantastic. I think at the end of the day, that's who I was rooting for for you to pick. Um, since you're coming off of Part 6 and you're ideally directing the film as well, I think C.J. Graham would fit those shoes tremendously. Although I, I absolutely, absolutely adore Kane Hodder, so it would have been cool to see him too. But yeah, Kane. I mean, Kane really, really kicked ass in the game. I mean, the stuff he does in that, I'm going, oh my god, that's violent. I mean, you know, he throws himself into that, you know, like like a wrestler, you know, just so physical, you know, which is great. You know, the way you know C.J. and I were going back going at it is much more of like an undead, not Frankenstein, of course, but that's where the, obviously, inspiration came from, because I never thought of Jason as a zombie. I just looked at him as being, you know, brought back to life with electricity like Frankenstein, and he's unstoppable. You know, he's undead. He's unstoppable. So it definitely goes back into the, you know, pre-George Romero, you know, eating brains and, you know, feasting on the bodies kind of zombie. You know, it's just, you know, something that was once dead is now walking again, and has an agenda. You just mentioned the game, and I wanted to ask about that as well. You were actually involved with writing all the Pamela tapes. That was your doing. You made those tapes happen. So I'm really interested if you pulled notes from your past scripts with Part 6 and that Elias origin story to make those tapes happen. No, I mean, here again is, is the truth from my standpoint. You know, I wrote the, the, the introduction of Jason's father at the end of... of uh, my Friday. And that was again there because I thought, what else could I do that would make this unique, you know, besides kids and car chases and underwater and all that kind of nonsense. I thought, you know, is there something else that could be done? And then the idea of Jason's father came up. And I love this idea of this kind of Stengali-esque man, you know, that, that if, if you thought Jason had any reason to have any connection with the supernatural at all, which is why he would seems to be so constantly unstoppable, even, you know, pre my film, maybe it came from this guy's, you know, DNA. So you don't see much of him. And I know they did some sketches of, of him for the uh, Camp Crystal Lake, um, yeah, Crystal Lake memory, memories, right? Uh, and 
so I, I, that's about all I really did was just kind of set it up and said, you know, what could we do with it? Well, Frank Mancuso, of course, said, look, people were so pissed off after part five that we were going to go off and make Tommy Jarvis into Jason. He said, I, I put anything out there that they're going to think possibly the next movie is going to be about Jason and his dad. You know, they, so I said, OK, I get it. You know, so we, we took it out of there. Then I saw later on a comic. Um, I can't remember which graphic comic it was, um, but it, it had Jason's father in there as this big brutish guy named Elias. Um, and I went, well, that kind of wasn't what I was thinking. And then when I got the offer for the job of uh, writing the Pamela tapes, I thought, what could I do that sort of embraces that, but also kind of gets closer to what I want to do? So in the, in the tapes, you know, there's a point when she says, when she's asked about, you know, Elias, Jason's father, and she corrects them and says, no, Elias was my husband, but Elias was not Jason's father. And she goes on to talk about how she was raped and, you know, then the man that did that, whose eyes she would never want to see ever again, you know, was the person that actually is Jason's father. And again, I wanted to throw that out there as, that, you know, there's, we haven't quite answered the question yet, you know, what's going to happen with that. And just so happens there's a, you know, fan film, Vengeance, that's coming out that, you know, they contacted me and say, are you cool about if we run with the Jason ball, Jason's father, but a ball and make CJ, you know, into Jason's dad. And I go, yeah, go for it. Shit. You know, I'd love to see it. So, um, you know, they've got that, that, that element in there. And they, uh, you know, they, they kind of did a, a mix of both the, you know, the super strong kind of dad in terms of just CJ's posture. And then also there's a sense of that evil, you know, what I call Svengali-esque, you know, quality to him. So it's been 33 years since Friday the 13th, part six. And I'm just curious, why now? You know, it's interesting with Friday the 13th and the situation it's in that Jason's being talked about more than ever, but it's at a time when nobody can even do anything with the IP. So I'm just really curious, why now? I, you know, I, I wish I could give you a, a really good answer for that. And I think part of it was, is that, you know, my career sort of took off and I went from you know, Jason and Freddie and Stephen King, you know, in the 80s and into the 90s, suddenly I'm doing true crime and the DC sniper and, you know, Michael Skakel and, uh, you know, and the Peterson murderers. And, you know, I was taking my, my, you know, love of the dark side and putting it actually in reality pieces and stuff. So just the whole thing of really sitting down and thinking about doing another Friday, you know, didn't really come into my head. And then when I kind of left all that behind and then my band kicked in and I started doing rock and roll, which I haven't done since I was a teenager, suddenly it became like, well, this is fucking cool at this point in my life to get a chance to get out on the stage and go crazy nuts and jump out there and blow up things and have smoke coming out of my hands and do all these great theatrical things that I was doing in the 60s, you know, when I knew Alice, but he was Vincent, you know, when a band called the Nads and we actually played on the same bills together. And I first met him at Frank Zappa's house, you know, in, in the mid 60s. And then ironically, you know, that was his claim to fame was doing those, you know, incredibly, you know, theatrical things out there that were on the, you know, on the horror side. Um, and I just love that, that, you know, that he just did shit that I never would have thought of. So just somehow it was a combination of, I guess, you know, the, the huge rise in, in popularity of the Friday films and the fact that. Like anything else, you take somebody away, you know, it's like they, people want them more than ever. It's like, I kind of like to make a James Dean movie or a Marilyn Monroe movie, you know, or an Elvis movie. Good luck. You know, he's, you know, he was kind of taken away. But I did, you know, I just I literally I just got these ideas that all kind of came together because they were sort of pieced out there. And I did have plans of, you know, bringing back Tommy and Megan together and maybe it's their kids you know, that get involved with it as well, you know, trying to play the ages and stuff. Um, but I, I kept going, no, I know other people can do that. And I know that's sort of more kind of what you would expect. And I just kind of wanted to do the unexpected. And it took this friggin' long before I found something that put it together. And then it, it really just kind of poured out of me. I think I actually prefer that choice you made about going in its own direction and kind of stepping away from the Jarvis story. It's something we're seeing in fan films right now, uh, like Vengeance. So having your own original tale again, I think is exciting in the first place. 
So there's a fan out there that is just now hearing about Jason Never Dies, your new script. What should they be excited for? Two things, I think. I mean, I tried to create a movie that if you know nothing about Jason, you know, you've never even heard it, never seen a cocky mask, nothing. And you want to go see a scary movie that this would fulfill that, um, that it just it kind of works on its own terms. There's a lot of mystery kind of about the character because the characters themselves in there don't quite understand who this is and why they're doing what they're doing. And even in the course of the movie, there's stuff that he's doing that you're going, wait a minute, that's not typical Jason M.O. What the fuck's going on here? So that is kind of a little more for the fans and the people that, you know, know kind of what all the basic rules are. And, you know, that I'm, I'm bending one element just a little bit, hopefully not enough to piss anybody off, but enough to say, okay, well, I'm doing the time you get to the end of the movie, you go, all right, I get it now. Okay, that's cool. So I wanted something that would kind of work for, for both audiences. And hopefully, you know, as a fan, you know, I, I can't necessarily put more emphasis on outlandish kills because the game has kicked everybody's ass on that. I mean, there's just no way what they do in the game can we get on the screen anymore. I mean, or even if we tried, you know, back in the 80s, we weren't allowed to do it. So, you know, I kind of pulled back, as a lot of people know, on mine. And so when they started cutting it down nine times, thank you very much, with the MPAA. Um, it was like frames, you know, a little of this, a little of that. Oh, we're still seeing his, his skull come up there when his head gets squished. Can we get that out there? And, oh, can we lose one of the back bends? You know, it's like, there's no even blood in that. What's the problem? It's like, it's just excessive. It's just excessive, you know, by the time you get to that point. So to go and say, all right, I'm going to go in and give you these kills like you've never seen, so intense or whatever, I've got some pretty cool stuff in there, I think. I hope so. And I mean, you know, there's been so many other movies that have come up with creative kills, I'm not sure, but I tried to make them surprising, you know, when they happen and try to put another aspect to them so it's not just the kill. There's also kind of the, what he does with the body and, and it just there's some stuff in there that's different. So I'm, I'm hoping everybody finds that, you know, to be like, yeah, I wish I had thought about that, <laughs> you know, and I mean, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that's the reaction, that, that, that that's really cool. You know, since you were involved with the Friday 13th fan film Vengeance, how do you feel about the whole fan film scene and the, all of them that are happening right now since there's just so many of them? Um, I guess just, I, I think I'd like to make one mention about the fact of all the fan films that are coming out that I'm beginning to sense there's so many of them competing to get out there first and all that, that it's become kind of a, a whole thing now of kind of judging one another's, you know, work uh, and that, you know, who's going to have the better film or who's going to have the better kill or whatever. And from my standpoint, guys, this is, should be just fun. I mean, nobody's making any money here. You know, when I volunteered to, you know, help the guys on Vengeance, it's because they approached me and they said, you know, would you be you know, interested in doing that. And I said, personally, I'm more interested in watching you guys do this. I want to come and watch and see what you come up with. And I love that with all the films. I mean, I've seen a couple that I go, oh my God, they're just absolutely surreal. But then I went, no, this is like, a, you know, a, a Friday the 13th nightmare. You know, it's, it's, it's just so fragmented and weird. I thought, you know, maybe this is like the dream of somebody was on a set and that night, this is the dream they had. It made no sense, but really freaky and intense. So I, I think there's all kinds of possibilities of what you can kind of do with it. And you don't have censorship and, you know, you have little amount of money. And I just want to encourage people to, you know, to make the best film they can make. And if they get stopped at some point because the lawsuit ends and suddenly somebody decides, oh, wait a minute, are you making money? Is it really going to charity or whatever? That them as filmmakers, they, they can hopefully get another job from it because it can, you know, can become your calling card if you're really good at it. And for other people, it'll just be like these, these cult movies, you know, these fan-based films that I don't know if any other franchise or, or particular, you know, series of movies of any sort, you know, had this kind of fan adoration that they'd want to go out and make their own and put it out there. And of course, in the digital age, you know, they can actually have distribution, which you never could before. I actually really appreciate you saying that. One of the things that's really interesting about these fan films is that they just kind of create natural competition, not only between filmmakers themselves, 
but between the fan followings of them. It seemed like you start to get to the point where some fans are attacking other fans, different films. At the end of the day, it's, it's not a competition. You know, I, I think what I know what I, my goal was was just to make a film that I would enjoy as a Friday the 13th fan and use it as a way of training my filmmaking skills and just getting better at this job in, in general and to apply it to future projects. Yeah, absolutely. And you come, you know, I've been, I've been fortunate the last five years I've been teaching filmmaking, directing, um, writing, acting and stuff at uh, Chapman University, uh, Dodge College. And, you know, it, it's not what I set out to do, you know, teaching, but it kind of fell in my lap. And what I got off on is like all this young talent coming up with things that I went like, I've never seen that. That is cool. Or look, let's, let me teach you the craft. Let me teach you the structure. Let me teach you the basic three act structure and what needs to happen. Or why is this particular sequence that Quentin Tarantino did so friggin' cool? What is it about that that makes it cool? So do your homework, study like you study the masters if you're painting or composing or whatever, and then you kind of make it your own and have that, that passion, you know, about it. I've not lost that 18 year old who still, you know, wants to, you know, get out there and, and, and do something mind blowing. You know, it's it's great when you're around nothing but that. And I and I unlike many of my peers, I don't feel threatened by it. In fact, I love the fact that I, you know, I get to see it happen first. And then if they can turn it into a feature film and as some of them have, you know, I'm so proud of them, you know, as students that they have just made that next step. And so, you know, I just think the competitive thing is only, you know, what can I come up with that's, that's really cool? And hopefully the other person went, damn it, I wish I had thought about that. That's a great idea. And, you know, what? I'm going to steal that someday, but you're not going to know it, you know. And that's all, all the greats have ever done. And Scorsese and Quentin are the first guys to admit, I got that from here. I got this from, you know, Kung Fu movies, whatever. It's like we all are influenced by all this stuff. Nobody's going to come up with something flatly original. You know, there's just been too much stuff done over the over the decade over the decades with film. But it's, it's certainly you know exciting to see somebody trying. You know, and and mixing things. And part of the reason I think Jason Liv worked is that I took this risk of putting comedy in there and satirization in there. And I thought the fans might hate me. You know, I'm shocked. Thirty three years later, it's still you know, beloved. Um, but I think somehow that mixing of genres kind of helped it become just not just a, not another one. And I think anytime as a filmmaker, you can do that, you know, do a horror that's romance, you know, or whatever you, you mix things and suddenly it feels fresh. So I just have one last question. And it's the same question I always ask when we finish interviews and it's really open and really difficult. So if it's hard to answer, I apologize for that. But if you could go back in time, and direct any movie in history. It doesn't matter the genre, although I assume you'll pick a horror film. What film would that be that you would go back and change, uh, you, you think your image fits best to? Wow, that's a really great art answer off the top of my head with that. Um, because all the great ones, it's like, how dare I even think about it? Um, Citizen Kane. No. Uh, you know... I don't know. I mean, it's like immediately I'm thinking of all the really good ones, and it's, you sort of have to take something that was like, like a really great idea that somehow got, you know, screwed up in in the in the production of it. Um, that would that would be something we'd want to go back in and say, okay, I know how to fix this. And God, right off the top of my head, there's nothing that's really jumping out at me. That uh, everything else sounds like arrogance that you think you can go in and make that any better. I did have one thing that did happen in my career, which one of my great loves is The Innocents, the Deborah Carr movie, uh, Jack Clayton. And um, I just always loved that movie growing up, that and The Haunting. There's something about the white screen and the black and white and stuff. And years later, I got a chance to remake, you know, The Innocents. That was called The Haunting of Helen Walker, and it was for CBS. So I was limited in that... Um, Obviously, I couldn't really take it at any place grotesque, but it really wasn't that kind of story anyway. But I got to work with Diana Rigg and some of the great Michael Goff and some of these great English character actors and stuff. But the main, you know, protagonist in the movie was Valerie Bertinelli, which a lot of people are going, oh, please, you know, her in a period movie and stuff. But I thought she really pulled it off because I changed the story. So it was an American governess going over and they've got she's got these two little kids that 
what I did with it to make it more creepy is that the way the kids looked at each other, they literally were like lovers. You never saw anything, but they literally did, you know, embody, you know, the, the, the two ghosts, you know, when they did things and stuff. And, you know, there's a kissing scene that the boy does to Valerie that's just like, oh, my God, he's like doing a full on French kiss with her. And she pulls back just horrified. And I think things like that were sort of fun to go back into a movie that you really loved. And to try to add, you know, other elements to it. So I, I did get a shot at that. So, you know, and I don't know if that movie, you can even find it any place anymore. But, you know, it, it has some very cool stuff in it, I think. 